This is Talk Business and Politics with Roby Brock. I'm Roby Brock. Welcome to the program. We are joined by Senator Tom Cotton this morning from Washington, D.C. As always, good to have him with us. Senator, uh, let's begin with the tragedy in Las Vegas, the largest mass shooting in U.S. history, 59 dead, more than 550 uh, injured. Uh, this has reignited the gun control debate in America. Do you think that this is uh, the time to be having that conversation? Do you think there are some things that can be changed in terms of gun access? Or do you think that we have all the laws on the books that we need and this is just the price of freedom? Well, Roby, first off, I just want to express my condolences and sympathy for all the loved ones uh, who have lost someone or seen a loved one injured out in Las Vegas. I think this is most appropriately a time of grieving and mourning and remembrance. Um, on the policy front, investigators are still collecting all the facts. So the Las Vegas police, the Clark County sheriffs, the FBI, um, and I think we need to wait until we gather all the facts about exactly what happened, the kinds of weapons um, that the shooter used, uh, what motivated him to do this before we jump to any conclusions. Uh, there'll be a time to debate that once we have a fully informed factual basis, which right now we simply do not have. Well, even outside of the context of this shooting, there have been other um, high profile shootings over the last you know, several months, several years. It, it seems to never ignite the debate in Congress that leads to a vote on changing anything. And there seems to be frustration from people on that uh, in terms of mental health background checks and terms of closing loopholes at gun shows, things that some people describe as common sense. Is, is that not something that you could see Congress taking up regardless of what the motivation was in this Las Vegas shooting? Roby, I think what some people in Washington call common sense gun control uh, sounds to a lot of Arkansans like uninformed efforts to put the federal government even more deeply into the, protect, into the Second Amendment. So for instance, something you miss, mentioned, the so-called gun show loophole. There, there simply isn't a gun show loophole. Any federally licensed firearm dealer at a gun show has to conduct a background check, just as he would if he was in his store. My wife and I were at a gun show in Little Rock just a few years ago. She bought a pistol there, and she went through a background check there. Now, if you're an amateur uh, hobbyist or you're selling uh, your firearm at a gun show, no, you don't have to, just like you wouldn't have to if you were just selling it to a buddy at your deer camp or giving it to a family member or so forth. I don't think many Arkansans believe that someone who sells a firearm to a neighbor or to a member of his deer camp or give it to someone in his family should have to undergo, undergo a background check. So there, there's misinformation about the nature of our gun regulations, but ultimately, you know, the, so many of the regulations we have, they're not going to stop the kind of evil that we see in so many of these mass shootings. Let's turn our attention to something on the domestic front here. Um, there was a September 30th deadline for Congress to reauthorize funding for the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, as well as community health centers, which serve a large swath of, of Arkansans as well as other people across rural America. W what's going to happen on this front? I think there's some uncertainty about the funding at this point in time, and, um, and right now they would be in financial limbo. Roby, I expect the Children's Health Insurance Program and Community Health Senators will be reauthorized and funded later this year. Uh, this was caught up some, uh, somewhat in the debate, in the broader debate about health care, uh, but now that, that is behind us for the time being, I expect you'll see those programs reauthorized and funded. Um, I'm supportive of them. Uh, most Republicans and Democrats in Congress are supportive of them. Uh, unfortunately, Congress oftentimes drops the ball when it comes to authorizing new programs or reauthorizing old programs. I think there's something like more than 200 programs that are currently past their authorization date, but they still continue to function under their existing laws. Uh, but I think Congress will be able to turn our attention in the coming months to having a new authorization for CHIP so we can make sure that it has any updates or modernization it may need. And before we take a quick commercial break here, let's talk about uh, tax reform. Will we see a bipartisan approach to tax reform uh, in terms of a vote? Will it go through the committee process? Will there be an open amendment process? Or do you think we'll see kind of the approach we saw in healthcare, where there'll be a, a pretty much partisan effort right out of the gate? Um, and we'll see where that goes if the votes can be there to do it. Roby, I'm a little bit more worried about the tax bills of working Arkansans than I am inside baseball and process questions. So ultimately what I want to see is tax legislation that puts a little more money in the pockets of hardworking Arkansans. 
Um, but to those process questions, yes, the Budget Committee is working on a budget that the full Senate will consider later this month, and then we'll move on to tax legislation. Uh, I wish that we could get some Democratic support. You know, most Democrats these days, though, have become somewhat radicalized on the tax question. They're not willing to even entertain the prospect of simplifying our tax code and eliminating a lot of the special interest provisions in it, unless you're also going to raise taxes. So we'll see what we can do to move them along, but uh, many of them are been very dug in and ideologically opposed to any kind of tax reform without higher taxes on Americans. All right. Well, Inside Baseball, that's what this show is all about, Senator Cotton. Come on. we're This is Inside Baseball for politicians right here. Let's take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and talk Iran and North Korea with Senator Tom Cotton. We're back right after this. And welcome back to the program. I am with Senator Tom Cotton. Senator, let's talk about Iran. You gave a speech to the Council on Foreign Relations on Tuesday night uh, talking about your support for decertifying the Iran deal, um, replace it with something stronger. I guess my question to you is, do you still think diplomacy will work with Iran, or are we just delaying the inevitable that there will have to be some sort of military action, some sort of military intervention to, to get that, that situation to a, a satisfaction point for you and for others in Congress? Roby, first, I think it start to it's important to start with first things. Uh, Iran is an outlaw regime. It's the most anti-American regime in the world. It's got the blood of hundreds and hundreds of American soldiers on its hands from Iraq. Um, the, na the problem with Iran is not the nature of the weapons it seeks, but the nature of its regime. Diplomacy can work with a nation like Iran, but it has to be coercive diplomacy. And that's where President Obama really dropped the ball. He made it clear from the very beginning that he would not take military action, no matter what he said. Uh, he outlined the two options that we faced in his mind as complete capitulation to Iran, which we did, or forcible regime change with 150,000 heavy mechanized troops followed by 10 years of occupation, as we saw in Iraq. Those are not the only choices we have. In fact, we've seen this with Iran. If you recall, in 1987 and 1988, Iran was mining the Persian Gulf. We reflagged oil tankers, and when Iran continued to do it, we blew up half their navy and several of their oil platforms. And guess what? That war ended pretty quickly afterwards. So if we are forced to take action, make no mistake, we can totally destroy Iran's nuclear capabilities. They know that. They need to know that we're willing to do that. And if they do, then I do hope that coercive diplomacy can get a better deal for the United States and that we can block Iran's path to a bomb once and for all. Do you think that this coercive diplomacy, as you call it, this, uh, and you said in your speech to the council, um, if forced to take action, the United States has the ability to totally destroy Iran's nuclear infrastructure, and if they choose to rebuild it, we could destroy it again until they get the picture. Would that be a solo effort? Do you think there would be support within the Middle East from some of our allies, support among Europe for that type of approach? Absolutely, Roby. Uh, Israel and our Arab allies in the Middle East view all of Iran as the number one threat. Because remember, Iran is not just a nation state, it is a radical revolutionary movement. It supports terrorists and militias in Iraq and Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and Bahrain and Afghanistan. Uh, it is an outlaw regime. So our allies in the Middle East, if anything, want us to take a tougher approach with Iran. Again, I hope it doesn't reach that point, but the Ayatollahs need to know that it will if they don't agree to sit down to a new round of negotiations and to fix all the many problems with the nuclear deal. Because ultimately, the, that deal doesn't block Iran's path to a bomb, it paves Iran's path in a mere 8 to 13 years, which may seem like a lot of time in some ways, but it's the blink of the eye in the life of a nation. Remember, it's only 12 years after the agreed framework with North Korea in 1994 that they detonated their first nuclear weapon in 2006. And look where we are now with that country. Well, that leads me to my next and last question here. Let's apply this uh, approach to Iran that you're talking about, this coercive diplomacy to North Korea. Everyone seems to think that if we were to try to destroy North Korea's nuclear capabilities, that it would be much more catastrophic than what I hear anybody talk about in terms of destroying Iran's nuclear capabilities. So tell me what's the difference there? Well, so, Roby, let me just back up and, and make the point about Iran and North Korea. 
um, we do not want to let Iran get to where North Korea is today. That would be so much more dangerous than North Korea is. North Korea is an isolated small country at the edge of the world. It's surrounded by four other nations who are vastly richer and more powerful than it is. It doesn't have a revolutionary expansionist ideology. Iran has none of those things. Iran does have that revolutionary expansionist ideology across the Middle East and really across the world. Iran is surrounded by other nation states that are pure competitors to it that would seek nuclear weapons if Iran got them as well. So that's why we need to nip this in the bud in the Middle East now because what we see in North Korea today is the result of 25 years of kicking the can down the road. And now, because that country has nuclear weapons, because it has a growing missile arsenal and potentially the capability to marry those two together and strike not just South Korea and Japan, but United States territory and Guam and Hawaii and Alaska and even the mainland of the United States, it makes it much tougher to confront them. Uh, I, I think that we can continue to put more economic pressure on North Korea. Ultimately though, it's going to take pressure from China. And at this point, China views a nuclear North Korea as being their interest. So probably the next set of steps would be to put more pressure on China and force them to put more pressure on North Korea. That's the only diplomatic route I see to resolving this showdown. All right, these are difficult issues. Thank you for your time, Senator Cotton. Thanks for sharing your uh, thoughts and insights with us. We appreciate you. Thanks, Robbie. And we are back with more right after this word from our sponsors.